Very quickly, this questioning panel will start with uh, Dan Kempson, a principal at GH Smart, uh, a, 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 a advisory uh, firm that helps corporations hire. Jasmine Sessoms is the Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Hilco Redevelopment and a, and a proud Philadelphian. Whoop, whoop, go birds. Go birds. <laughs> I'm surprised no, no Eagles chant has uh, emerged tonight. Uh, and finally, of course, 13 minutes to the uh, pugilistic former mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll cut mine short to accommodate you, Mayor. <laughs> Reclaim your time. Reclaim. Uh, uh, I also want to want to really thank. Uh, I didn't get a chance to thank from the bottom of my heart Jeff Brown, uh, a, a private citizen putting himself out there into the political realm, and we need more people standing up and getting involved in politics. So I meant to I meant to say that to him uh, before he left. And. Another person who uh, I, I'm very excited to welcome is former council member Quinn Ona Sanchez, uh, who uh, f a few years ago, a few years ago, she and I spent a night in a bar, and uh, uh, she drank me under the table, and and I wrote, my husband's in the room. I'm and, in trouble now. And, and and I wrote a piece in which I called her a political badass. So. Let's get let's let's see some of that badassery on on display. And Dan, uh, we'll kick it to you for 13 minutes. So my first question will not be which bar, but <laughs> it was a good one. It was a good okay. Um, but I would like to spend these first 13 minutes focused on various aspects of your leadership and how you approach that, particularly at the scale required of someone to be mayor of Philadelphia. My first question is. What part of your background will you pull from to best represent the citizens of Philadelphia? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was a CEO at 26 years old in a nonprofit organization. Um, after having done some community development work, um, when I was 15 years old, I was managing a quarter of a million dollar small community development corporation of Hunting Park, Hunting Park CDC. I don't still know how I ended up doing that other than nobody else wanted to do it. And I was taking accounting in high school and I thought I was going to go into the accounting field. I have since changed my mind. Um, but then, you know, fast forward, um, I took over an organization that was dear to my heart, which was Aspida. I was part of their leadership program. Um, and I was on the board and the organization was about to shut down. And um, going from board to executive director was a hard decision for me to make, but I couldn't see this organization who had made me uh, fall apart. Um, and so I decided to take the position knowing I probably won't get paid for a while, and I didn't. Um, and I remember my husband saying to me, who was also a product of Aspida, saying, either you, you grow it and you think big or you shut it down. And so we thought big. Um, and that was during the um, charter school conversation. I worked with state officials, um, got the charter school law passed. Um, and in the middle of seven audits and staff reorganization, um, we started a charter school. We grew. We actually carried out some of the long-term mission and vision um, of the organization. So, you know, 26, executive director, making payroll in my neighborhood. And when I built the charter school, my office, I built it in the back. The new CEO, I'm sure, doesn't enjoy that. But it was because I could look out the window and see my mother at her house. And I just felt it was important that that whole building really reflected um, the challenges and then the opportunities that building that charter school did for my neighborhood of Hunting Park. Thank you for that. You know, as you know, the potential future mayor, you will often have to make decisions with not all of the information that you would ha want to have to make that decision. When is a time when you had to make a decision with only partial information, and what did you do? So this is where I think it's really important someone's lived experience. I've lived every challenge the city faces, right? I'm a product of public housing, 
first in my house to go to college, um, watch my mother and my family struggle. So for me, a decision is always based on how is this going to impact the most vulnerable? And are we doing this for short-term gain or are we thinking about people, not programs? And so because I've had to make those kinds of decisions my entire life, for me, a decision is how would this impact the people that I represented in my district or in Hunting Park that I lived with. Um, because I think too many times, whether we're in government or we're in the private sector, um, and look, I'm a policy girl, whole on policy. But ultimately, when policy, when the rubber meets the road, how, how does it help people? Can you give an example of, of a time when you had to help people with policy and making that decision and what that was like? So, you know, we're going through that right now when we look at health and human services and our challenges with mental health and opioid addiction in particular. I live in the 80s where the crack epidemic really decimated Hunting Park, right? We arrested our way out of that. We disrupted families. And then um, I'm elected to serve a district where the opioid addiction um, we have asked poor black and brown people to shoulder the burden of a crisis, worldwide crisis, but specifically the most vulnerable community in the city um, to do that. And so juggling getting folks to understand harm reduction and meeting people where, where they are, but also getting people to understand that recovery is a lifetime journey and that ultimately family reunification and a reform system can work so that it's not an either or. That's not what we have in the city. Um, we have essentially um, concentrated a problem and overburdened a, a community. So the civic leaders that I work with who are incredibly resilient, getting them to understand that I lived Hunting Park and that didn't work, but at the same time trying to get them to understand that this is my child who's working through this and getting traumatized, this is my child balancing those interests and saying that safety comes from when everyone is safe and when everyone is treated with dignity. So it's really hard to have those tough discussions with people um, and humanize uh, the challenge. Completely. You served multiple terms on City Council, how has your approach changed during that time? What do you do differently, or what did you do, did you do differently towards the end of your time? <laughs> I don't know. Um, Nutter might say I was easier on Kenny than him. I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I yes. Think <laughs> I'm a process person. You know, my background is around, is very process oriented. Um, so in the beginning, what I saw in council, and you know, in our freshman class, which was the best freshman class ever, uh, Bill Green, Curtis Jones, and I, you know, we came from very different perspectives. And for me, when you're trying to create transformative change, you have to understand that you're disrupting people's safe space and then having those challenging conversations. So when I did business tax reform and I had to sit with the Chamber of Commerce and people who wrote tax policy who were trying to tell me that their tax policy was good for their regional members and I was saying to them, well, I'm a Philadelphia legislator and I need tax policy to be good for Philadelphia-based businesses. Um, but willing to have that, those hard conversations and say, how do we move forward, right? So that um, the conversation is one that is respectful, you hear people, and ultimately you make a decision. Um, and in council, as we say, six votes gets you to nine, and sometimes it gets you to 12, and you get it done. What was the hardest conversation that you had, and, and how did you come to a, a solution? I don't know, Nutter and I had a couple of those. Um, <laughs> you know, you have a bureaucracy and folks who, you know, are sometimes tasked with checking off the boxes, not connecting the dots. So when we were introducing income-based payment plans, both from real estate perspective and a water perspective, um, sitting with lawyers telling you that people should just pay their bills, right? I remember having a conversation with one of the lawyers saying to me, because my district had the highest 
um, debt ratio. And so I wanted to get off that list and I wanted to create pathways for people to comply, which by the way, at the end, we collected more money and it was good for everyone. And I remember sitting with lawyers who would say to me, well, Maria, people should just pay their bills. And I said, you know, in Hunting Park, if you have a car, you're deciding between the car insurance and maybe Catholic school, um, but they're not taking vacations in Aruba, right? And this changing the mindset. So having those tough conversations and not, not like calling people out, although I did, and sometimes I said, coño carajo, and I got a call from the mayor. <laughs> um, but it's like changing the mindset of the best way for people to be and feel like they're contributing is when you give them a road to compliance. And poor people should have the dignity to get to that road to compliance. So those were the tough conversations when you're sitting with someone who like looks at numbers. And I, there's a couple of speeches I've given on the floor of council where I'm like, you give me numbers and I give you names. Let's not have that conversation. Let's continue on this thread and talk about um, moving people along or motivating people. As mayor, you would have to deal with, I think you know, we heard 25,000 you know, different employees, multiple constituencies. What is a situation where you had to drive external stakeholders, so people who didn't work for you, and drive them towards a decision or change? And what did you do? So <clears throat> I really believe in public-private partnerships, right? And, and bringing, again, folks together, the different stakeholders and people with competing interests. So when we were doing the land bank legislation, you know, I, had, I was working at Honey Park Community Development Corporation in 1985 in high school. And at that point, we were talking about land, right? And then I get to council, and it took me seven years to get it done because there were so many competing interests they're in the private sector. And that was one of the first times that I saw a coalition of people from the real estate community, um, the BIA, and other in the community development corporations. And we all rallied because we essentially knew that we needed to streamline this stuff, right? And so it was interesting watching folks who, you know, the first meetings, everybody's back is against the wall. And at the end, when people just started liking each other, it was like, oh, these guys are not as bad as I thought. Um, we were able to get to a resolution. Was it the, the best one? No, I would still do a, some changes to it. But watching, you know, the them and the us in a room and getting people in a room and, and forcing them to talk to each other, I think it's the best way you get to a resolution. Because everybody walked out of that room unhappy. So I know we got it somewhat right. No man or woman is an island, and no mayor can be a superhero. You know, successful leaders really build teams which highlight the strengths that they themselves are weaker on or need complementary viewpoints and skill sets for. What are the areas, skill sets, knowledge, or otherwise, that you would surround yourself with in order to be successful as mayor? So... I've held different positions, you know, when I, when I made the decision to run for public office in city council, um, I had other folks who said, run for state rep, run for this, and I was like, that, I don't want to be one of 203, you know, I'm, I'm the only girl with two older brothers, so all I knew how to do was fight, but I knew how to fight in a group of three, but I wasn't going to fight in a group of 203, so I always wanted to be in council, and I always wanted to be in council as a district council person because I knew that was the best place where I can actually do transformative change in a, in a context of a geography, like, like I can own this. And you know we're little mini mayors and district council folks. So I always knew that that was the skill. But the legislating part of it was not something that I was as prepared to do. And one of the things that I learned very early on was that if you're not prescriptive in your legislation, a good idea could be killed by bureaucrats, right? And so for me, it's understanding that I, I think of things of how do they get operationalized right away. What I don't always take a moment to see, and I think one of the reasons I'm running for mayor and challenging myself is because we gotta think big and then we gotta think bigger, right? And this issue of, of thinking big and, and, and getting folks around you 
who can come in and say, you know, it's not the no, it's the how is hugely important. So for me, that's the skill set I want. I want innovation around me, folks who, who know that I, for me, I'm the yes girl, not the no girl. It's like, how? How do we get there? Bringing that kind of innovation and creativity. You know, I love Philadelphia, but we got some idiosyncrasies to who we are that, you know, we think the world revolves around us and there are other cities doing great things. And so how do you embrace that? Um, that's what I'm looking to bring with me. People who are not scared to challenge me, right? And people are, who are not scared to think bigger than what we've thought. Thank you very much. That's, Thank you. That's great. Thank let's, you. let's move on to Jasmine Sessoms and of Hilco Redevelopment. If you don't know about the Bellwether District, they, they're building a city within a city. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Jasmine? It, it's amazing. <laughs> so full disclosure, I was Maria, and you might hear me call her councilwoman because that is what I've called her for the last seven years. I love her down. Mm -hmm. There will be no bad cop over here. <laughs> Let's jump into it. Maria. Ooh, that sounds weird. <laughs> Council lady. Citizen Maria. I can't say it. First of all, Mayor Nutter did not understand the, the Spanish. Can you tell us what you just said in Spanish? He over here is asking me, she Jasmine, took, what did she, she say? She took advantage of me. She knows I don't speak Spanish. No, no. And then she probably said We going to ask her. Council lady, what, did you, what does that mean in Spanish? Translate what you said. Um, it means shit. See, there you go. And we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Council lady, look, I'm a black lady. I can't hide that. You are a brown lady. I have a Shirley Chisholm pen. You know specifically how much I love Shirley Chisholm. Famous quote. I don't have prepared questions. I'm just going to be very honest with you. I left them in my office. Poor Mia has helped me. So we're going to wing it. Okay. A famous quote. If they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Tell me your folding chair moment. Um, wow, I've had so many. In fact, okay. in, this, in this race, um, the gender bias is real. Um, so I'm going to try to be diplomatic around no, this. No, don't thing. be diplomatic. <laughs> um, when we were doing some of the business tax reform, I was doing it with Bill. And, you know, Bill jumped onto my idea. You know, we were doing this work. When I, when I was running for office, I went to all these small manufacturers in my district. And they were like, city, get out of here. You don't get it. And because I grew up with two older brothers, when I won, I went back. <laughs> and I said... What do we do about this? And when we were doing the business tax reform stuff, we would go to meetings, and it would be rooms with all white men, and they would look at Bill and ask him to explain it. And Bill, who has become a very enlightened man because of his relationship with me, um, <laughs> would say it's Maria's idea. Let her explain it. And I could just see the faces of everyone saying, well, Oh, okay. It was always great to have the reinforcement of Bill, you know, obviously, um, uh, saying it in white man's words. Because sometimes I, I would explain it. Look, I was like, look, this is small businesses. This is what black and brown businesses do, right? If you're taxing them two years the first year, they're going to hide it. If they hide it, they can't capitalize. If they can't capitalize, they can't grow. And then Bill would say <laughs> something like, they have to pay less taxes. We need to create transparency for them. Like he would say all that. I was like, look, folks, <laughs> in the neighborhood, you know, everybody knows that the, the poppy store, the corner store, my son told me now it's the poppy store. We know that the poppy store is an economic engine, but we, we stifle the poppy store with rules and regulations. And so those were moments for me um, that it was like, wow, this is really real. And, you know, I know many men said to him, what is this Latina from a poor district trying to lead a tax fairness conversation in the city of Philadelphia? And I did, and we did it. Love it. Council lady, you will be not only our first woman, our first Hispanic woman as mayor. What does that mean to you 
and how do you make sure you are not the last? That's a great question. Um, I've had this conversation with all the very highly qualified women who are in this race, and I've said to them, this, this is a moment in time, and let us not lose sight of the historical nature of this race. We have four highly qualified, viable women running, right? We haven't had that since Happy Fernandez. And, and I've said to them, you know, the young women are watching us. And the men are also watching us. And of course, they can do it better, nevertheless. Um, let's make sure that we are running a campaign that is respectful, that uplifts the skills that we bring, and that really um, sends a message that on May 17th, we're all going to get together and move the city forward, right? So it, the campaign is what the campaign is, but May 17th, right? I want to be able to sit with the other three women and the other men, unless they've already fixed everything, um, to move this city forward. And I think that is, that is, in, is important. And so um, I've made it a point um, to maintain you know, that, that level of, of respect um, and, and uplift the, the highly qualified women in this race that I share the stage with. I have an own personal question I need to ask you. Mm -hmm. Council lady, I gotta tell you, we were chilling in the seventh councilmatic district. You were uh, well liked, you got legislation done, you could have been council president. Why mayor, why now? That's a very good, converse, very good question. Um, going back to learning to legislate, even in the most prescriptive way, um, I'm an executive. I like the fix shit. Okay, that's right. I want to get in the weeds of the water department and its 25 year plan and say, how do we ensure environmental justice through the water department and our tree canopy and, and these water outlets? So I want to fix that. I want to look at the structural, historical, discriminatory practices that we have had the thing that troubles us the most and makes the city the most unsafe is our trash situation. We have a streets department that is one of the lowest paid, where 96% of the workers are African American, and when they start the job at $38,000, if they have two kids, they're eligible for food coupons. But that is the department that is supposed to keep us clean and safe. I want to fix that. Who wants to talk about that? I want to talk about it. I want to talk about how we equip and we train employees and give them a dignified job so that they, you know, when I was growing up, getting a city job was a big thing. You know, I became deputy commissioner of elections under Alex Talmadge, and I was in finishing up college. No, I had dropped out of college. And, um, I left my job to run Lynn Yagel's campaign because it was the year of the woman. And I remember I was a single mother and I remember coming home and my mom was saying, what do you want? You got a title, you got a city job. Why are you leaving your job? And I'm like, because this is a historical moment in time. There is a woman running for the Senate and I want to be part of that campaign. So. So that's why I want to meet the moment where it's at, but also create the moment and the opportunity for, for my skill set. So if, I, if there was someone better qualified who, who, again, lived the challenges that I lived in this city, um, comes at this as the cheerleader. Look, I represented a challenging district where every single day, no matter what I planned, something happened, and I had to pivot, right? And so... The whole job of mayor is one that I, I just want to do. I know I can do it well. I know I can bring people together. I look at opportunities, crises as opportunities. 
Um, and I think this city needs that. And it needs someone who's gonna manage very difficult conversations about race and equity and be able to get people to trust that this is going to be different. Because what you hear from folks is, we've heard this before, we've heard this before, we've heard this before. This has to be different. Um, and that's why I believe my particular skill sets at this moment in time is the right thing. And look, the political pundits, you know, I had a cancer scare a couple of years ago. And I can't tell you how many people text me and told me also, I guess you're out of the mayor's race. Um, and I'm like, no. I overcame cancer. I overcame political corruption in the 7th Councilmatic District. Um, this makes me stronger. It really recentered me as to what the why and now. Because you're right, I could have stayed in council, I could have been in leadership, I could have been majority leader um, this last time around. But I wanted to meet the moment in the time and I, I also wanted um, to not stay in a seat in the council seat forever. You know, I've had four or five people elected who've come straight out of my office because I believe in promoting others. You know, Ketsi Lozada, who is my chief of staff, you know, I knew she was gonna be the next council person and a good person for the district. Jason Dawkins, when I first got elected and from Frankfurt, you know, I said, you know, to the barbershop, I went back to the barbershop and I said, you're gonna give me a young man, we're gonna, we're gonna build this community. You know, he got elected as state rep, Danilo Borgos. You know, that's what you want. You want a leader that uplifts other folks um, in this process. And there's so much talent and so much resilient people, but if you haven't lived that, if you haven't seen it, you know, I go to the downtown from the seventh and just be excited about the resiliency that I saw in, in the district. And I wanna take that energy, harness it, and get people to feel like we won the Eagles game on Sunday, and then we're gonna win the Super Bowl every day. You know, I'm a testament to that. You don't get a Jasmine Sessoms without Maria Kiona Sanchez, and you've heard me say that. Now, I only have 148 left, so I'm gonna ask you one final question. I have worked for the best mayor in Philadelphia. Don't tell Mayor Street. Mayor Michael Nutter. And under Mayor Michael Nutter, we had a lot going on. We had the DNC, we had bike share, we had the Pope visit, we had the NFL draft. It feels like years ago, but that happened. Mayor Nutter made Philadelphia a world-class city, point blank and period. How do you continue that? Because our current mayor, regardless of how you feel about him, that part slipped away. How do you bring that back to fruition? I think it's very important. You know, this campaign, and I've said this on the, on the trail, is not about 2023. It really is about 2030. Who are we gonna be? The next mayor will have the opportunity to hire two out of five civil service employees because of retirements. You have an opportunity to transform the entire government so it better looks like and feels like the city of Philadelphia. The next mayor has an opportunity to build out an infrastructure that is really equitable, right? I was in a West Philly conversation the other day that they were talking about the drive and drive getting closed and I said, you know, we, we send messages and sometimes not subtle about who we want and who we don't want in certain neighborhoods. So if you want to build a city that is diverse and mixed income, you're going to need leadership to do that. Um, you're going to need a mayor that will embrace the world heritage status that we have, right? We are a day's drive from like 75% of the population. We have an international airport. Like what are all of the things that we can bring together um, as part of that? And for me, the test will be, you know, 2026, we celebrate our birthday, right? How do we look back at the challenges of how we got here and reuse that moment in time to readdress the inequities that we've had in the past and say that celebration is, is different. How do we celebrate FIFA? You know, when I got elected, I didn't have a public soccer field in my district, yet I represented a large Latino population, right? In a sport that's so international. So I just feel like the city has not embraced language 
diversity in the way that we, ca that we can, that the status of being a World Heritage City um, gives us. So I, I, wanna, I want us to embrace that. I want us to look at our art institutions, our museums and others and say, you know, even this economic downturn with, you know, post COVID, how do we use that as an opportunity to get people from neighborhoods to look at those institutions the way, you know, the premier institutions that they are, the barns, the arts. So for me, um, you need a mayor that, that, that wants to do that work, that sees that work, that sees people, um, and will embrace um, all of the opportunities that exist. Downtown is going to change. Look, hybrid work is here to stay. But we can't have a city where the mayor won't tell the city employees come back to work, but expects Comcast and IBX to pay for breakfast and lunch for their workers to come back. So it's about setting the tone and not asking the private sector to do what we don't lead and do first. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Let's uh, move on to uh, Mayor Nutter. 13 minutes, Mayor Nutter. Got it. Good evening. Um, how are you? I am good. And your health and family? Very good. Very good. You made reference to it, but I had already uh, planned to uh, mention it. Both of us in the last couple of years uh, shared some uh, personal public information about uh, health challenges, and I just thought it appropriate uh, to ask you how you're doing. Very good. Very centered. Very good. focused. Good. Talk to us about the decision-making process. You, um, you were in your fourth, you in your fourth term. I was. Fifteen. In term. Fifteen, 15 years? years. Okay. All right. About the same as mine. Um, it's fourteen and a half. Um, share with us a little bit the thought process you went through to decide mm -hmm. this is what I want to do now, and run for mayor. So, so thank you. Um, for that question, um, you know, after the health uh, situation and, and my being focused, I was very clear after my last election, you know, I ran four times, didn't get party support, beat the party anyway, because I keep saying I'm going to make this party better against their own will. Um, having chaired the Appropriations Committee over the last six years, really growing frustrated with hearing what people say is important and then watching how they invest the money. And looking at some of the structural issues that were there and looking at, um, I used to call the budget process the Hunger Games <laughs> because commissioners were forced to plan for a budget that they had, not for what the city needed, right? And you're, so you're constantly talking about stuff is, I go back to the Pajos, because I'm the Pajo and policy girl. When you ask the streets commissioner, how many potholes do we have and does your budget cover all the potholes? And the commissioner says, can I call you? Because we know we didn't, right? It's the stuff, it, that kind of stuff, right? Um, you know, having a mayor come in and say, we're gonna do zero-based budgeting, we went from program budgeting to performance-based budgeting, and me trying to manage that process as ch of chair of appropriation, saying, folks, who, what are our values, right? A budget is a moral document. What is the public safety plan for every department? What's our anti-poverty uh, plan for every uh, department? What is our inclusionary plan for every department? So, with all of the power that you know goes with the chairmanship of appropriations, and we did good stuff, we, the public-private partnership, the promise, the poverty plan with United Way and others, but it wasn't enough. It's not transformative enough. Mm -hmm. um, and COVID for me just really um, demonstrated that when we make bad policy decisions, people die. What are your three most important goals and how will you accomplish them? So again, I, I want to go back to zero-based budgeting. I want to transform city government where every single city department has an anti-poverty plan and looks at how it supports, right, um, communities that have um, not had the investment, right, so that we can readdress. Because people talk about equity moving forward. 
And it's like, you can't move forward because you're still not equitable. Like, you have to readdress some of those issues. I, so I want them to prioritize it. I want every department to lead on public safety, citywide camera program, appropriate lighting, all of those things. And I want a serious inclusion and economic uh, opportunity plan for every department, how we contract with folks. Look, again, you know, I've said this in other, or other places, we have departments um, that have the same contractors, right? They have a shore town. They go, up, they go to the shore in the summer and they decide how much they're gonna charge us in the fall when they come to bid. We gotta break that up. So my priority is departments that, whose value system is anti-poverty, uh, public safety, and inclusion and economic opportunity for all. So you've talked about your district and we know that it is both quite diverse and challenging, but because we have blunt conversations, um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that parts, certainly of Kensington, are just a mess. And so, how do you explain to the public, I was a district council person for 15 years, this is what's going on here, but I'm not only gonna fix this, but I'm also gonna take care of, in essence, the other nine districts, because, you know, we have 10, right? So how do, you, how do you explain that? So Kensington is a creation of bad policy um, with a containment strategy that hasn't worked and the lack of leadership to say this is unacceptable anywhere, right? That's what Kensington folks want to hear. I went to high school at Mass Bomb. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you there weren't drugs in Kensington, because I cut school in Kensington enough to know there was always been drugs in Kensington. But the level of lawlessness that we've allowed, and then in the name of harm reduction, we have allowed people to live on the streets of Kensington in an undignified way. So what would you do? So we have a 14-page plan that we did, which was called Restore Kensington. Because one of the things that Council Member Scuola and I were the most frustrated about is that ultimately it didn't matter how much money we would put in and invest in Kensington if the policies didn't follow. So what are the policies? People living in tents, there's no dignity in it, right? Getting people out of those encampments is hugely important. So that is important. You're going to move Treatment. Them. You're going to move them? I am going to, we've identified who they are, and I really believe that most of those folks have families that would help us. We need a family reunification plan. Some people are out there because of their trauma that do need housing. And so we got to move them to those, to housing opportunities that are real, that they can sustain as they transition. We need to transition our mental health system. We now have drugs that our drug and alcohol system cannot handle. Track, fentanyl, and other things have changed the game, and we still have barriers to access. I have an uncle who is in recovery, and when he wanted to go to recovery, he says, I need a nine-month program, and I want to leave the city. And I knew the Secretary of Health at the state, and I couldn't get him into a program. So we need to change the programs to really wrap around and be prepared to uh, provide um, the dignified services that, that, they, that they need. And then we need enforcement. Mm -hmm. We need enforce. We have to say it is not okay in Kensington. And Kensington is a creation of it can't happen in South Philly. It can't happen in the Northeast. So what do we have? It's called a bad containment strategy. The only person who can make those policy decisions is the mayor. So on the one hand, you are proudly known as a fighter. Didn't know about you and your brothers. Um, great quality in a mayor. Um, but how do you balance? Can't fight with everybody. And at some point, how do you make that transition as a unifier to bring people together and lead this city? So, <clears throat> I always get this wrong. It's like, do I pick my enemies wisely? Something like that? Sometimes. I always get it wrong. My husband gets yeah, mad at me because I always get it wrong. They usually um, pick me. <laughs> <laughs> there, 
Look, I got elected on an agenda that was anti-corruption, clearly wanting to be a disruptor. Um, so advocating strongly is something that I would do. But every piece of legislation I passed was 17 and one, was in zero. Like I know how to build consensus, right? I also know that the legislation that is good for, for my district was good for the city. Every piece that we did, BERT reform, the land bank, it was always thinking about, yes, how does this help this constituency, but helps others. And I'm a process person. I believe in dialogue. So there are some people who have exploited the system that I'm okay with them never liking. Well, I hear you. Um, as you well know, often a lot easier to get uh, 17-0-16-1 when you're a member. A little different when you leave the fourth floor, go to the second floor. You might have that experience. Um, you want me to respond to that? Because I've talked to all the living mayors about this over and over again, so. Sure. <laughs> we have more than virtually any other city in America. I will, so. I will say to you, in my chairmanship of appropriations, I've gotten an opportunity to spend time with my colleagues and I know what's important to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I will treat them as independent elected officials and respect and value what is important to them and who has elected them. And creating a common vision doesn't mean that should come into conflict. So I know there's always this debate, people from the fourth floor don't know how to act on the second floor. <laughs> I'm gonna act right. Okay, good, good, uh, good luck with that. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so I've got two and a half. I'm gonna do a lightning round of two questions so it'll be really easy. Um, I have this very firm belief that there are, there are a lot of critical players in public safety. But there are four, in my opinion, that drive what happens. The mayor, the police commissioner, the DA, and the courts. We'd have to say, it seems to be a fair amount of either disconnect, possibly dysfunction in that regard. How do you fix that? So my public um, safety plan, which is on our website and you should read, um, calls for a, a public safety dashboard because I agree with you. The only place where I would say it's an and is at the public defender's office. When people enter our system, because look, we know the next shooter and we know the next victim. We already failed them. We failed them in our public schools. We failed them when they entered the juvenile system and we didn't wrap ourselves around them, right? So my belief is at the public defender's office, we have an opportunity with families to really find out what is going on. And they are a place where if we wrapped ourselves and provided the right interventions, we can move forward. Um, well, so a public, but a public safety dashboard, right. people need to understand best practices. What are caseloads in the public defender's office? What are caseloads in the parole office? Why don't we have more people in house arrest and daily reporting systems, right? Like you can then hold everybody accountable. Mm -hmm. The criminal justice advisory board um, is a discussion that I would lead as mayor. Mm -hmm. Because all of those form part of a very expensive, which is now close to 30% of our budget, mm -hmm. is in that portfolio. Yep. And they need to be held public, publicly accountable, judges and, and, the, and the district attorney and, and everyone. Okay, lightning round, 35 seconds, 30 mm -hmm. seconds. Greatest accomplishment, greatest disappointment so my in public greatest, service. In public service, my, my greatest uh, accomplishment has been looking at fairness and equity from my lived experience and knowing that I can do right by the most vulnerable and still grow and, and get folks to, to comply. Um, my biggest disappointment is you can legislate with the best intentions and some bureaucrat will take it and mess it up. Or a colleague. Compromise, yes. <laughs> <laughs> or a colleague. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, the, the great, great questions, uh, great answers. Thank you, panel. Let's, let's uh, go to Charles Ellison for, uh, from Word for some questions from you guys. Yes, we have questions from the audience. How are you doing, Councilwoman? Good, good to see good you tonight. Good to see you. All right, good, good. Uh, excellent. So we have uh, a few questions. Oh, don't pass it on. Thanks. Um, what will you do day one to reduce gun violence? 
So very important, we will, um, in addition to asking all departments to align around this public safety strategy, in the first 100 days, I'm going to go to those intersections where we know the next crime is going to be, and I am going to put a camera, I'm gonna light it up, I'm gonna clean it, and I'm gonna secure the vacant buildings around that. All of those data points lead to safety. So part of reducing the gun violence is doing that. I will continue to work with state and federal partners around gun reform. Okay, so what concrete steps, is another question from another audience member, what concrete steps will you take as mayor to make the city not only safer, but more attractive and uh, more of a beautiful place to live and visit? So I think it's hugely important, and that's, that's why when I talk about the operating departments are what leads and should lead our public safety um, discussion, you know, having the water department lead our tree canopy situation so we can deal with some of these health disparities. You know, in the seventh district, we did a lot of work around green spaces and parks and recs because we knew that those were spaces where people could come together. So making sure that there's equity in public spaces, um, making sure that our corridors are safe, I think are hugely important. Um, uplifting, right, the diversity in our corridors um, so that people visit um, outside of, a, of the core center city. So making it safe, uplifting the diversity that exists in the, in, in the neighborhoods and really recognizing our public spaces that people figured that out under COVID. I'm a young kid, Hunting Park was everything we had. Um, understanding that those spaces need to be intergenerational, right? And they need to be places where we bring folks together. All right, all right. Philadelphia receives funding to address issues and then hands that money to unqualified cronies. What will you do to stop financial mismanagement and no accountability in city government? There's dozens of hours of testimony um, when I was working on procurement reform. I talked about the short town in Jersey. I'm not kidding, it does exist. I will disrupt the contracting process because we have 12 to 20 contractors who get all the work from all departments. And they, we legally say that they're responsible bidders. How can you be responsible if you're manipulating the bid? If you are not on time, right? Everybody knows you go into a project with the city and you're not on time. So what would I do? I will disqualify immediately anyone who has a current contract with the city of Philadelphia, is not meeting their participation numbers, is not meeting their timeline from bidding on anything else until I can legally disqualify them from the current work that we're doing. We got to disrupt it and it's going to be blunt and it's going to be ugly, but we have to do it. Okay, next question. Uh, how would you encourage more Philadelphians to volunteer in their communities and mobilize people to participate in national service programs? When I was at Aspida, we, we had a good, we had a AmeriCorps program. Um, you know, I want to encourage that in our young people. Um, as we talk about the new requirements for graduation and people needing to, young people needing to do internships, I want us to honor, you know, senior core, you know, there used to be all of these programs where people were engaged. What is missing here is the connectivity. You know, government has to work with our private partners in figuring out how we connect people to interest and what they like so that if I just want to go read at a school, if I just want to clean a park, or if, if I want to share my experience, um, that, we cre that we create a hub, right, where folks know where to go, right? And that was supposed to be what 911, 311 was supposed to be like, but I, I really do think we need to bring that conductivity back. What's in your backyard? But more importantly, what's in West Philly's backyard or Northeast's backyard? Getting people to go outside their traditional neighborhoods is hugely important. You got to do that as mayor. You got to go to places and show people that we have um, many great assets outside of Center City Core. Yeah, different neighborhoods in Philly do seem like different universes. Uh, hey Charles, what, let's, let's make it one last question because I, I want to be careful about getting all these great citizens out of here by nine o'clock. I'm really so <laughs> appreciative that everyone's come and, and stayed this long and um, uh, we, we really want to concentrate on time. So one more, sorry. One more, yeah. No, these are great questions too, by the way, from the audience. Um, Thank you for these, uh, to the audience members. 
What accomplishments of yours, uh, Councilwoman, in the past, uh, or what are the accomplishments that you'd like to highlight of yours, Councilwoman, from the past, um, that make you qualified to be the next mayor? So again, demonstrating to government that policies that help poor people, the most vulnerable, comply, getting biz small businesses to comply, really does create a more effective and efficient government. This notion that when we stabilize families, that there's a cost factor, we need to move away from that thought. And so introducing income-based payment plans. When I got elected, people were losing their homes for water debt. We stopped that. You know, people were losing their homes for tax debt. So we stopped that. Government should not be the destabilizing force in, in our communities. And changing that mindset in the city and proving that when we give people roads to compliance, they comply, I think was my greatest achievement in terms of government bureaucracy. All right. Thank you, Councilwoman. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, audience. Thank you. There's one, I'm going to ask one final question, which I've asked all of the participants so far. If elected mayor, would you commit to coming back to this very space, hopefully with these same people, for an annual performance review? Absolutely. Well, with my well, badass report card. <laughs> badass report card. Uh, can't thank you all enough for coming. Can't thank uh, this panel uh, enough. Thank you all. We'll see you at the next one.